Well, hello, I'm Jerry McKee, and welcome to Prime Time on Monday night. It is 7 o'clock. Uh, just missed the clocks going off, but you'll hear them later on through the broadcast because we got all these clocks in here. We've got a special treat for you uh, tonight. We've got uh, Katie Adams here, and she's going to tell you her story. It's a little bit unique. Uh, you've heard a story from uh, another person that had similar situation, and we're going to talk about uh, drugs. We're going to talk about... Uh, addiction, we're going to talk about abuse. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the difference in between because there is a difference in between, not much, but a little bit. So we are going to go to a commercial and I'll be right back right after you hear Linda's Beauty Nook. If you're looking ugly for Christmas, hey, go there. Ask for Charlotte or Emmy. Looking for a local beauty salon with an experienced stylist who can get your hair looking great. If so, you came to the right place, Linda's Beauty Nook. We are proud to be the premier local beauty salon in Jonesville. Customer satisfaction is our number one priority. Whether you are looking for a cut or a color, modern or classic, our stylists can do it all. Contact us now and find out why so many local customers come to us for all their hair styling needs. That's Linda's Beauty Nook, 128 North Main Street, Jonesville, South Carolina, 864-674-6359. That's Linda's Beauty Nook in Jonesville, South Carolina. You can ask for Scarlett, a licensed cosmetologist and master hairstylist, or Emmy Lou Carpenter, a licensed cosmetologist. Go to Linda's Beauty Nook, and they will take good care of you. Have a great day. Okay, I'm back. Um, if you heard me through the... Uh, <laughs> through the commercial, apologize for that. I just have to run it back and see. Shouldn't do that things, but you know how it goes. Technology and fat fingers don't go together. <laughs> well, let me introduce you to. Uh, <laughs> well, that ain't going to get it there. Let, let me just. Uh, Look you here. And here's Katie Adams. How are you doing? I'm good. How about you? I'm doing real good. And thank you for coming on. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, a little bit about growing up and uh, where you at now as far as uh, feeding a lot of kids. <laughs> oh, man. I thought, well, you know, having Jerry's kids was a lot, but uh, you're feeding a lot of kids. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just a backwoods old country girl. Um, <laughs> backwoods? <laughs> yeah, backwoods. I grew up at, um, off, off of Fair Ridge Highway um, on a small farm, and, uh, now I am a certified manager of the cafeteria here in Union at Sims Junior High School. Um, we serve about s close to 530 kids a day, round and about. Wow, um, that's a lot of children. This is, yeah, it is. Um, this is my first year as a manager, but I've been with the schools for six years now. And I love my job. I mean, um, you're not in it for, definitely you're not in it for the money or, or anything like that. You're in it for the kids and right. what you can do for them. Now, do you have to cook breakfast too? Yes. The door open. Okay. You said your audio is not on. What can you do? Let me see here. All right, folks, let me change something out here. Uh, I had a couple little things here that went. They should be able to hear you now. <laughs> but okay. uh, but there's, they're probably able to hear you right now. It's just a couple little buttons I had to switch here. And uh, I'll ask my engineer to come back in or give me a high sign that uh, she hears me. And she'll be back in. All right. There we go. Sometimes when you switch buttons, you want to go back on there. It's not real good. All right, let me make sure. Let me see here. Let's see. All 
All right, I bet you can hear me now real good. I got to get new glasses. <laughs> there you go, I can hear it out here now. <laughs> Y'all probably hear some feedback because uh, she got the page wide open. <laughs> oh, now she can hear us. All right, now, uh, now she can hear me. It's like I said, got to switch some buttons here a little bit. And uh, we've got Katie Adams here, and she told you a whole complete story. I'm glad y'all showed up today because uh, you missed it. No, I didn't really. I just want to say that. Uh, I'm still just double check my audio here. Oh, yeah, still looking good. Now, Katie, we're sitting at the Christmas tree. Y'all ready for Christmas? Uh, yes, very much so. <laughs> ah, me too. Well, see, I, I, I do something different. Uh, I buy, I have all my Christmas done. In January mm -hmm. for the end of the year. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. smart. That way you don't have to do it throughout the year. Right. When I told the wife that, she just kind of looked at me funny and says, well, I don't see nothing. I said, exactly. Not buying nobody nothing. <laughs> so mine's done. That's the easy, cheap way to go. It is. It is. And we can blame all this on the Grinch. Yep. And, well, Katie, you're here to tell your story. And... What most people don't realize that uh, you know, you're just by looking at you, you're just a regular normal person that can sing wonderful. If you ain't never heard her sing, she sings great. And uh, can't play an instrument though. I wanted to get that out there too. So don't ask her to play a guitar and sing. And don't ask me to play a trumpet either. So tell me how, uh, we're going to talk about drug addiction, addiction and drug abuse. And uh, there, there, I know there is a difference between the two. Yes. Um, when you're battling an addiction, it's, uh, addiction is kind of like the beginning process. Um, it's when you figure out that that's something you enjoy doing, and you know it's something that's not good for you. Um, the abuse is when it is taking complete control of you. It's, right. Well, I, I know that uh, a lot of the abuse is that where uh, it leads into addiction, mm -hmm. that uh, the abuse also comes from uh, using, and, and this is against the law. People, you might not realize this, but this is against the law for people to go and say, hey, uh, you know what? Uh, I'm having a little anxiety or I'm having this little, hey, I got some my some pain pills mm -hmm. here I can give you that belongs to me or yep. that person can say well I want to borrow you, uh, hey you, you got some uh, things for diabetes yep. and, and, and it's like borrowing medicine yep. medication and, and that is against the law to oh, do yeah. uh, you can get locked up and in trouble for that mm -hmm. uh, because you've got prescription drugs that's made for that person out to that person yep. and a lot of times people will get abusing that and then next thing you know, it's something they crave and they have to have. Now, tell me, how did how did you get started on on that track? Um, when I was about twelve years old, um, I had hung out with some. I wouldn't say just rough people because they were all kids too. But um, one of my friend's older brothers, they had um, marijuana, and that's where that's where it all started. And so that that was my first. Now how old would you? Twelve. Twelve. Wow. That was the first experience with it, and um, then when I turned fifteen, I really got into um, dabbling in different kinds of drugs: pills, pot. Um, I, I drank. Now you started when you started that young age, like mm -hmm. you know, at twelve. That kind of blows my mind a little bit, like that. But I, nowadays, it's, it's, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. Uh, my years growing up, I think I was like sixteen when I first uh, took my big drink of MD twenty twenty, and my last drink of MD twenty twenty, mm -hmm. which if people don't know, it was kind of a cheapest wine that you can possibly get that we can. <laughs> put out for like 98 cents to get a whole mm -hmm. bottle somebody had to buy for us though but being that young did you have hanging around other kids did you have peer pressure to do this oh yeah oh yeah and it wasn't from the um kids my age it was from like their siblings like their older siblings and stuff that would introduce us to this stuff and and it's very common now 
it is it's very very common now now when you got uh when you first took that step mm -hmm. uh was it an older person older person that really kind of yes it was, to be uh, friends, um, party. yeah how did he approach you to do this because you, you know what was right from wrong and, oh, yeah. and um well at that age you're very you're very moldable yeah and um when you're influenced and and you're you're in a certain like group of people it is very easy for you to say okay well everybody else is doing it i'm gonna do it and it's really coming from not having a strong enough mindset for yourself and now that i'm older i know that um if you don't have your own mindset, if you have the mindset of a follower, anybody can get you to do anything. And it's not really on them, it's on you. Right. And, and that's the reason I'm asking you more questions about being young, because you, you work around younger mm -hmm. people and, and you can see something. And, and parents that's, that's going through the same thing uh, with their young kids, they can talk with you oh, yeah. and to get experienced of it of what you went through mm -hmm. because if someone can counsel you that's never took drugs or never anything like that they really don't understand no. quite much uh, no. about that now a lot of people say that marijuana is not addicted now would you uh, did, did, did that or did that have a stepping stone to something else i wouldn't say that it was the stepping stone the stepping stone really was me um People are different, and if you have an addictive personality, whether it be for a soda, you know, if you, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, anything can chocolate be an cake. addiction. Chocolate. Yeah. I mean, um, it's really what kind of mindset you're in. And I was, from the time I was 12 until I was 24 years old when I found out I was pregnant with my son, I was a horrible addict, like on and off it was it was pretty bad how did at, at the age of 12 and around that young age like that how did you hide it from your parents did it was just an occasional thing it wasn't an every day thing it was just like randomly maybe like once a month or something if i went to that person's house okay so was it just a the person there is that was someone maybe you hanging around with more mm -hmm. or and because that, that's what young oh, yeah. kids do now yeah. is, is they they get in with the group and and that group is uh is doing it and you don't want to feel uncool right yeah. and, and and it's pressure and, to it and like i said it, it's it doesn't fall on anybody but yourself and the first thing about realizing that you have a problem is realizing that you are the problem you know, well, you have to make that realization for yourself. Um, I tell a lot of people all the time, you know, I, I want, if they need somebody to talk to, I will talk to them. I'm not perfect by no means, and I'm still a human, but I am so much more further in life than I ever expected I would be, and that's all because God gave me a second chance. Right. Well, I, I know myself as a... Uh, did how did you feel when you first was you scared when you first took say for instance even your yeah. marijuana was you, oh, was yeah. you scared to oh, see yeah. what it was going to do was it going to mm -hmm. freak you out mm -hmm. yeah and, you're scared but when you're that young and your mind's just open to whatever you'll you push on through it well i guess when you did did you watch someone else do it first mm -hmm. and Say well, okay, uh, well, they're, they're safe. <laughs> you know, it, it was just like everybody was laughing and having fun, and I'm like, okay, maybe I need to, I mean, I'm going to try it. It doesn't take much. I mean, when you're a kid, that's all you want to do is laugh and everything to be funny, silly, and all right. that. And so that was, that was my drug of choice from about 15 until 18. So when... That being a drug, George, of course, I think even even for myself, because I've I've been mm -hmm. I've took drugs before mm -hmm. uh, years and years and years ago, mm -hmm. uh, younger than, than you have. Yeah. I knew about the marijuana. Of course, the drugs now are totally different oh, yeah. from back when I was growing up. But we they, we did have uh, 
the, the marijuana, and uh, and I think that was one of my first drug. Mm. And uh, I think most of the time it is. And I know people say it's a gateway, but it's it's all up to you. Well, uh, yeah, because I, I don't see the marijuana as being a gateway to it. Mm. Uh, I mean, like I said, you can be addicted to anything, cigarettes. Mm -hmm. or like, I think you can be addicted to cigarettes more than you could to marijuana. Yeah. Uh, uh, quite a bit of it, but I, I, my experience, I don't did not experience it. Oh gosh, I got to, yeah, I got, got to have, have that marijuana. I got to have that mm -hmm. right there. But it's more of a recreational yeah. going out and drinking, yeah. which is another addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we 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 kind of uh, sometimes look at that as a stepping stone in, in different mindsets. So yeah. we'll come back and talk to you about the next step after the marijuana, right after we hear from our sponsors from up in Jones Away, Linda's Beauty News. Are you looking for a local beauty salon with an experienced stylist who can get your hair looking great? If so, you came to the right place, Linda's Beauty Nook. We are proud to be the premier local beauty salon in Jonesville. Customer satisfaction is our number one priority. Whether you are looking for a cut or a color, modern or classic, our stylists can do it all. Contact us now and find out why so many local customers come to us for all their hair styling needs. That's Linda's Beauty Nook. 128 North Main Street, Jonesville, South Carolina, 864-674-6359 at Linda's Beauty Nook in Jonesville, South Carolina. You can ask for Scarlett, a licensed cosmetologist and master hairstylist, or Emmy Lou Carpenter, a licensed cosmetologist. Go to Linda's Beauty Nook, and they will take good care of you. Have a great day. All right, we're back, and we're talking to uh, Miss Adams here, Katie, and we're talking about drugs and our steps into from marijuana, and we're going to talk to her about what was your next step, what, what, what drug that, that you started taking next. Um, it was pills. What what kind of pills? Um, <clears throat> lower tabs was, and Percocets were like some of the first that I had tried, and. Now, did, it, you, did did you have uh, like some people get those? I guess if they get hurt or something other or yeah. back hurt or something like that. Did was it that or was? It well, just, the the people that I knew knew people, and you could just get them. Okay. Um. A Klonopin also, and uh, then all of that actually es escalated to like Xanaxes, which is nerve medicine. But um, when you're abusing those, it turns into, there's a lot of things I don't remember. Um, it gives you a feeling of just, you're out of this world. And when you're battling those demons, it's, it's very easy. How, how many would you take a day to say... Uh Xanax. Uh, which one was more powerful? I mean, I'm the not, Xanax. The was. Xanax was. How, how many of those were you taking? Maybe today? two. Two. Yeah, and it wasn't daily. It would just be maybe like twice a week. Okay. Whenever I could get my hands on them, you know. Um, now was it very costly? Yes. I don't, I don't even know what the, yeah. the price of them even well, now is. I wouldn't know now. Yeah. Uh, I, you know. I know prices, <laughs> like everything else, goes up. Yeah. Drugs do too. Inflation on drugs. Uh, yeah, and it yeah. does. You know, and <laughs> yeah. Inflation hurts. It's, you know, people can't, the groceries go up, they yeah. can't afford marijuana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because you eat everything in your house. Oh, yeah. That's so right. uh, that's what I'll tell everyone anyway. <laughs> now, uh, how did the Xanax make you feel? Because I, I want people to know how these drugs make you feel uh, because some people got this false thing of saying well I'll take that right there and I'm good all day but and see that's how that's the mentality the way I see it now 
is that the devil uses, he has tools every day. And so these drugs are a tool for him to use when he knows you have a weak mindset and you don't have the faith that you need, he, he takes that step in. And so whatever that drug is, he amplifies it. He amplified it for me. Um, nobody in this world made me do it. It was just, it was me battling myself and the devil. And so the Xanaxes would make me feel like I could just do anything in this world. So they put you in that mindset that nothing yep. was impossible. Yep. It was just and that's how it is for a lot of pills. Um, Adderall. I was I was addicted to Adderall. Um, probably from the time I was twenty two until I I found out I was pregnant with my son. Right. Now, with these making you feel that you can top of the world. Yes. Uh, did it affect your job any at that time? Um, what affected my job was it was not wanting to go to my job. I wanted to be home or, or wherever the drugs were at. I wanted to be at a bar. I wanted to be drinking and being with my friends and this and that. And so did the, did the, would you say that you were uh, addicted even to, to drinks? Oh, yes. Yes, most definitely. I was an alcoholic. Yeah. So so one one addiction just kind of piled on to yeah. another one. That's that's where I'm I'm telling you it's all a mindset thing. If if you have an addictive personality, it is very easy once you start that ball just keeps rolling. Right. And um but it all turns back to your mindset. So when you you're taking the, the, the drugs and it's got you thinking, well, yeah, you know, I don't want to work, but you got to work mm -hmm. to pay for the drugs and yep. pay for the alcohol and yep. stuff like that. So how did you cope with that? Did you ever uh, go in, you don't have to say Pacific Jobs or anything like that, mm -hmm. that you were uh, high or you was on, uh, been drinking or anything like that before? I mean, because I, I know that when we oh, take yeah. these drugs, we go in and think that we can oh, yeah. do um, anything. There was plenty of times, plenty of times, and... It uh, it's 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 now that who I am. It is it's very embarrassing to know that I would still be able to get up. I would drink all night and do drugs all night, and I would get up and go to work hung over and still having the effects of everything that I had done. You know, did, and did it affect your production at work? No. Didn't no didn't because affect? the drugs that I would I did. You have uppers and you have downers. Okay. And what that is is um, pot, it, marijuana, it it calms you and yeah. slows you down. It's a downer. It's a downer. But when you have Adderall or, or Xanaxes, which Xanaxes are a downer also, but it just depends on you. The Adderall is what I call manufactured legal meth. It, it makes you feel like you can run a marathon and you can do it all. And there's nobody going to stop you. So when you was at work, did you have to take that sometimes to get you through the day? Or? Oh, yeah. And Because it's uh, partying all night long, getting up early oh, going. Yeah. It, 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 and you don't sleep. Right. You don't sleep. Well, I know my younger days like that, and I used to go to work sometimes that way. That uh, you know, matter of fact, we had a, a, a party at one job, and we kind of... Uh, friend of mine, we drunk a little, quite a bit and uh, smoked marijuana mm -hmm. and all this right here. And then they asked us to drive a vehicle and do a big old, big old truck mm -hmm. to another town to make a living. We weren't supposed to be doing you know, yeah. that. And they said, you, you're going to have to do it. So me and him takes off and we were just, we wouldn't, we didn't need to be on the road. Yeah. But to me, and, and you've probably been there too, that, ah, this don't affect me. I can drive. Yep. And, and and have you ever done that? I mean, oh, far yeah. as there's there's plenty of times I really have no idea how I got home. Yeah, and and it's and it's so scary it nowadays, is. isn't it? It is to look back on those times that 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 you've done that. You thinking, it is. especially when you get, how did I get home? Yeah, what did I do that night mm -hmm. before? And and, and taking it, you ever have your friends tell you, said, oh, you did this and this mm -hmm. right here, and you're thinking, 
Oh no. Yeah. Oh yeah. There was uh, there was plenty of times I, I woke up with a busted lip or, or you know, <clears throat> and not know what happened. Now, as you were growing older, would, would you live in with your, your parents then or, um, or did you move out? I had met my son's father um, before that. But I'll just go ahead with this one. Um, I had met my son's father, and we both really grew an addiction together. Mm -hmm. um, I've all I was raised up in a Christian home. My my mama and my daddy both like they made sure we were at church. Um, my mama always just showed all this love she could, and I just. I pushed away from everything, and so see that that's 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 a good point that you're bringing out there because a lot of Christian families, uh, when their son or daughter is going through this, they don't seek help mm -hmm. because they are ashamed because they're mm -hmm. they're their church and they, and they're mm -hmm. and they belong to the church, and we don't want the church to make us look bad because. We're not raising our children right, yeah. and and they get the mindset of that, and, mm -hmm. and they pull back and and close that door when yeah, and and, and it affects them too, doesn't oh, it? Oh yeah, it does. It affects everybody around you that loves you. Um, <laughs> my mama, I know, and my my dad also, my daddy. He, I know my parents, my grandparents, my my sister. I know that they prayed me through every bit of it. Um, I should have been dead a long time ago. Mm. I've I've been in many drug-filled, abusive relationships, um, mentally and physically, and um, it's not something that I want my child to go through. So I'm not afraid. I'm now not afraid to talk or tell my story because not only do I want my child and I hate for him to know stuff, but I want him to know where I came from. I'm the only person who chose my path. Uh, nobody made me do this. You know, right. I chose the path and I thank God every day because I know even every black eye, every almost overdose I had, every every bad moment it all led me back to Jesus, and mm -hmm. it led me to be able to be a mother to my son. Where well, that that bringing you back to God, bringing you back to Christ, that's implants from your parents that's right. and, and, and growing up. Now you mentioned your sister. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever try to say, "Hey, you need to try this" or anything? Lord, no. She would have punched me in the face. <laughs> She's my older sister. No, older she, sister. Yeah, oh, hey, yeah, yeah. She would have got me. She would have got, you. got me. Yeah. Well, did she ever talk to you and try to? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My my sister. But we but but during doing drugs stuff like that, we we think that we know everything. Oh, right. Yeah. We 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 oh, know yeah. it all, and we we're perfect. Mm -hmm. And we've got the perfect solution of mm -hmm. not getting caught. Right. That's right. <laughs> and that's never never right. It's no, so wrong. No. No, it's, it's like guys in prison tell one another, like I said, I tell you what, says, uh, I, got a, I got a foil proof like that. And I, mm. Really? And where you at now? Yeah, still <laughs> and, there. So when, we're going to come back to this uh, to ask you uh, about your overdoses, just about overdoses. We'll, we'll come back right after this. We're going to hear from our sponsor from the Linda's Beauty Nook. Go up, get yourself shined up. They can paint your fingernails they can uh, tease your hair and they don't have much hair for me are you looking for a local beauty salon with an experienced stylist who can get your hair looking great if so you came to the right place Linda's Beauty Nook we are proud to be the premier local beauty salon in Jonesville customer satisfaction is our number one priority whether you are looking for a cut or a color, modern or classic, our stylists can do it all. 
contact us now and find out why so many local customers come to us for all their hair styling needs. That's Linda's Beauty Nook, 128 North Main Street, Jonesville, South Carolina, 864-674-6359. That's Linda's Beauty Nook in Jonesville, South Carolina. You can ask for Scarlett, a licensed cosmetologist and master hairstylist, or Emmy Lou Carpenter, a licensed cosmetologist. Go to Linda's Beauty Nook, and they will take good care of you. Have a great day. <laughs> All right, we're back, and uh, we've got uh, Katie Adams here and telling her story like this. Uh, Katie, uh, before we left and went to the commercial there, we was talking about uh, taking certain drugs, but you mentioned about overdoses too. Uh, how many times would you say that, that you've done it? And, and tell us about the overdose. How did you know that this happened? I can only recall two times, and I, it wasn't like a complete overdose, but I knew that I, it, it had gone too far. Um, I was at one of my friend's houses and we had taken some pills from somebody and passed out completely. And when I, I come to, I knew something bad had done happen. Like I knew my body had just shut down and I instantly felt so thirsty. I just could not stand it. And when I tried to get up, I couldn't like, I just could not feel anything. Couldn't feel my legs. Like, and I remember crawling to go down, I, she had steps down in her house and I rolled down her steps because I needed to get a drink. And I remember when I hit that floor, her mom had a picture of Jesus. And when I hit that wall, that picture of Jesus come at me. And so I was, <laughs> I was really scared, but I made it to the refrigerator army crawling and passed out there again with what? my hand on the refrigerator. So that's that was like, that was, I think, the the worst moment that I really thought I was going to die. Now, did her, the person you're staying at their house, mm -hmm. did her parents wake up, or did they, I mean, were they her, asleep? Her were mom they coming was in? working. They were so working. So we were, you know, being teenagers. So that was, what was was it, was that scary to you? Yes. I mean, uh, yeah. Because yeah, I, I know scary. it would have to be just mind-boggling it was um, now, did you did you go to see any medical attention no. or anything like that no so you just took it as it as it was mm -hmm. well most people do most people do if you survive it you're like oh man i'm invincible i can i can make it through it now i can do it again yeah well i remember i, I overdosed myself and i was end up in a coma for three or four days mm. And, uh, and and it's totally different because you don't know where you're at. I was found somewhere yeah. uh, that, that I didn't know where I got there yeah. in the car. And that's all because of the overdose that, that was taken. And it messes your, your thinking, ra thinking rationally. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you... And you think about things like, did you think about, of course, being a teenager, teenagers don't think about dying, mm -hmm. do they? It, they're, no. they're invisible. They can, no. they can do it. But did you, did you ask your friend or did you ask, you know, what, what happened or do you remember what, they, what you took? Yes. Um, it was ecstasy. Yeah. Um, not too long after that, one of our really close friends and it, it really affected my drug intake after this but one of one of our really close friends she uh she got hit by a car and killed she was 13 years old um and after that it was just like a spiral from then on especially with the alcohol every weekend and then when she got hit by the car at 13 was this an accident or was she on anything? Yes, it was an accident. Yeah. Like, she was she was riding her bike. Um, yeah. So yeah. So that affected you pretty 
yeah deeply and uh, to the point that i would lash out uh, i remember my parents made me go to school and i remember yelling at my daddy because i was so upset at school i was in high school and i i wanted to go home and he come and picked me up and i remember lashing out at him telling him he didn't understand how i felt and now that I'm older, I I feel like I, I should have just eaten those words because my dad lost his brother when when he was young. Right. And so to me, she was like a, a little sister to me. And now that I'm older and know that, it's just like, man, why did I say that? You know. Well, you know, teenagers, parents know they say oh, yeah. they lash things oh, yeah. out like that. But you know, back then, I know you my age is way way back in. I'm way older than you are. <laughs> Uh, we really didn't have anyone talk to. It really, wasn't yeah. you didn't have a guidance counselor. Yeah. You didn't have someone that you can talk to or or kind of trust. Yeah. Because if it's you can't go to your siblings because they're gonna uh, like yeah. they're gonna knock you out. They're uh, gonna tell uh, yeah. on you and not understanding. And and, and that's one thing I, I really appreciate you doing is coming on here and talking about this because letting other people know that if they have an issue, well. They look up Katie Adams, and they can send you a message. Yeah. You know, we, I, I need to definitely. talk to you. I need to ask you about something. Most and, and and I think God lets us go through things like this oh, yeah. to where it teaches us, and He keeps us safe enough to where we can help someone that's else right. that maybe is going to go too far with it. That's right. And uh, now, when when was this? How you well? This overdose. How, how old was you then? Oh, I was 15. 15. Uh, when did you, you said you had another account, you had two? Um, it was when I was 17 years old, or I was about to be 17. It was before I switched schools. Um, I was hanging out with a girl, and and we had taken some pills and stuff, and then we went back to my house, my parents' house, and I fell out on the floor in my bedroom. And I know my mama remembers this because I remember it scared her to death. Like, I, I don't remember falling out. I just remember my mama waking me up. Mm. And so I, I I put her, I put my parents, I put my family through it. Yeah. You know? Now, what did you take then? Do you remember what it was? Um, it was? It was a lower tab, but it was what they called specs. Like it had little blue speckles. Right. On the pill. Because they got slang names for mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of different yeah. uh, M, M&M, &M, M's, stuff yeah. like that. Uh, now, did your mom call 911 or take you no, to the doctor? No, because I got up and I was very defiant. Okay. And now, we, we talk about our, our parents. And when we're at that age and you're doing drugs... We don't think about them, do we? We don't, no. we don't think they're the ones no. that we love. How we hurt them, only thing we're kind of you kind of think about is uh, yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you really don't even think about yourself. You don't care about anything. Yeah. Nothing. It's just like you're a you're a vessel walking on the world, just be doing drugs or getting that chasing that high. And this is very important too, is to let people know. And, and including myself, is, is knowing that uh, your peers that's doing the same thing you are are not good people to talk to, mm -hmm. to, to get counseling from. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're no longer addicted and gone through counseling herself and, and, and off of this, yes, but they're not a good person because the only thing I'm going to tell you is, is hey, you'll feel better. Take yeah. this, right? Yep. Yeah. Did you ever have that conversation with oh, yeah. some of your peers that uh, was doing the same thing? Said, oh, oh, yeah. If you take this, you'll feel better. You'll do this and do that. Oh, yeah. And, well, in when did you realize that you started, that, that you really had a problem? Oh, man. Um, I knew I had a problem when I was... 18 or 19 years old it really started to set in but at that point I felt like I was too far gone and I just wanted to keep on going the path I was going 
Um, now, was there, was there something inside you that a, I don't know, some have depression? Oh, yeah. Some, some have yeah, things um, that happened to them a while back, that, mm -hmm. and, and you get in that mentality of not, mm -hmm. like you said, not caring. You know, you don't care if you, you don't even care if you overdose. Yeah. You don't, you don't care if, uh, it just, you got that no care, and, and, well, I, I'm, I'm okay, didn't die before, mm -hmm. uh, and it almost gets to the point to where you think, I can't die. Well, when I was 21 years old, I was in the one of the worst abuse, abusive, physically abusive relationships I've ever been in, and um, it was it was drug fueled. Also, um, there was times I, I thought I was going to die, um, not from drugs. Um, Sometimes I wish, during that time, I would wish that I, I I would try. I would try to overdose just to be able to get out of that. Um, now was then, your spouse then, was he on drugs also? Yes. So um, that, and that's a, a bad combination. Yeah, very bad. And I've never really spoke out publicly about I've spoke with other women about this but not publicly but um the day that I, I finally I finally decided I, I had to get out of there um I fought I fought to get out and I did I got out but that after that um after that was Another turning point of, well, the mental abuse kept on going after after I left there and got away, and um, so the drugs just kept on rolling in. And when I was when I was 22 years old, I met my son's father, and uh, we met at a bar. I was playing in a pool tournament, and. Um, we started smoking pot together and stuff and talking and ended up dating and that's where um, he introduced me to meth. Right. And it was just an occasional thing for me at first and then it become an everyday thing because he would have it every day and I'm here you can have something. I, I loved how it made me feel. Um, and that's what I hear from a lot of, and I've talked to a lot of meth addicts in, yeah. in Greenville. I get called out in the middle of the night sometimes, I'll, and they come up to me, I talk to them, and I, and I have questions for them because I want to learn mm -hmm. uh, uh, why that you're doing this. And, and that meth is very addictive. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, oh, yeah. I'm just really shocked that, that, that of the people that overcome that, because mm -hmm. it takes some willpower and God power it was to get God you power for me. to get you out of that. Um, yeah. Now, when you taking this meth, uh, it had to affect, uh, of course, your relationship. Oh yeah, and um, it makes you after you don't sleep at all for so long, you hallucinate and you start hearing things and. You start stealing because it's like uh, you see ten dollars laying around over here or whatever, and it's not yours. Oh, I'm gonna get that because I need it. I need it so I can get that. Right, because meth is look was cheaper, wasn't it? Oh yeah. And uh, and now they got all kind of other drugs is that that destroys the minds, and and meth is one of them that mm -hmm. can do that if it's long enough. Now, when you're taking it, did I, I know that. The people around you had to know that you're. Oh yeah, something. they had to. I, I lost so much weight. I'm not a small girl at all. And the day I found out I was pregnant with my son, I weighed 174 pounds. So like for for my body stature, I looked sick. Everybody knew, and I kept telling myself that nobody knows. Nobody knows that this well, it's is even in your face because oh, it, yeah. it changes your whole face. Oh, yeah. Because I've seen some before and oh, after yeah. like that, and then yeah. it, it changes drastically. It is like being possessed by a demon. 
And that's what I will compare it to yeah. because that's what it is. It takes away your sleep, doesn't it? It takes everything away. Yeah. Uh, where did you, after the relationship, you said, okay, I got to get out of this right here. Uh, are you thinking too, that I got to get the drugs out of, away from me or I tell you what, let's, we'll, we'll come back to that right there. I want to, uh, let's talk about how the steps you got to get where you're at today. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, of course, people get a hold of you and, 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 and talk with you about what you went through from mm -hmm. either being a, a battered wife uh, to, to the drugs and things. So you, you've got, I, I think God, unfortunately, lets these things happen mm -hmm. to us to give his glory mm -hmm. and to help others right. and all. So I really truly believe that. So don't take drugs because it's going to make you look ugly. But you can go to <laughs> Linda's Beauty Nook, Scarlet, <laughs> Emmy Lou. They'll make you look pretty. Emmy Lou does all the West Springs housewives hair and stuff and makeup. So go see them at Linda's Beauty Nook. Are you looking for a local beauty salon with an experienced stylist who can get your hair looking great? If so, you came to the right place, Linda's Beauty Nook. We are proud to be the premier local beauty salon in Jonesville. Customer satisfaction is our number one priority. Whether you are looking for a cut or a color, modern or classic, our stylists can do it all. Contact us now and find out why so many local customers come to us for all their hair styling needs. That's Linda's Beauty Nook, 128 North Main Street, Jonesville, South Carolina, 864-674-6359. That's Linda's Beauty Nook, in Jonesville, South Carolina. You can ask for Scarlett, a licensed cosmetologist and master hairstylist, or Emmy Lou Carpenter, a licensed cosmetologist. Go to Linda's Beauty Nook and they will take good care of you. Have a great day. Okay, we're back and uh, we're talking to Katie Adams and. We're talking about uh, drug addiction and her story, how she had uh, from drugs into an abusive relationship. And now we're going to talk a little bit about how she overcame this. How, when did you realize that you needed help? And, and I know that you can't do it on your own. No. Um, <clears throat> the day I found out I was pregnant, I took a pregnancy test at, at home. And one of my lifelong friends, she was there. And um, I remember seeing those lines and just my heart stopped. And I'm like, oh, you know, I, here I am. And I come out expecting, you know, excitement from my son's father. And there wasn't. And when I went to the doctor and I heard... My son's heartbeat. That's when I. That's when I knew. That's when you knew you had to. I knew. That that life inside of it was your responsibility yeah. now, wasn't it? And I make sure <laughs> I get on his nerves, but I tell him all the time. You know, you save well, my that's life. What, that's what parents are supposed to be. Yeah. We're supposed to get on the kids' nerves. Yeah. Yeah, I get on, <laughs> I get on mine all the time, especially some of these crazy videos I do. Uh, where did you go get help? I didn't. You didn't just do it on your own? I didn't. Um, did, did you have times that, that you just wanted something so oh bad? Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How did you res resist some of these withdrawals and things? Because you got a lot of strong-willed people that says, well, I don't want to go to these counselors. I don't want to go into a rehab center because they got rules. They got all this right here, and the people might think I'm crazy and stuff. It was like God flipped a switch. Though. It was like a, a switch was flipped for me, and it wasn't like a, a overnight flip. It was a he gradually kept giving me. He would give me enough willpower to just press through, 
And then eventually it was like he was building my strength up for me to be able to stand on my own two feet. Okay. Now when you went to the doctor for pregnancy, mm -hmm. and did you let the doctor know? Yes. And, yes. And because I know some medicines they have to give you that you, yeah. they can't give you because of you on yeah. that. What did the doctor say? Did, did he just check say, well, you keep doing good what you're doing? Well, they would, like every time I would go to the doctor, they uh -huh. always checked your, your urine to see what your sugar levels and stuff is. And also, if you were a drug addict, I'm sure that they tested it. Now, whether right. they did or not, I don't know. But I would assume that they did because I was completely honest with them when I went because I was so scared. I was right. scared that something would be wrong with him. Right. Because a lot of times mm -hmm. when taking drugs like that can cause birth defects. Mm -hmm. And I've seen him. There's no birth defect there. He, no, he, there's not. He, he don't he's an old boy, I tell <laughs> you. Uh, now, when was it that you sat down or did you ever sit down with your parents and say, look, I was a drug addict? They knew. They knew? They've not. They knew. They knew. But, and... Uh, there's no way that they couldn't have known. They just didn't know exactly what. Right. Do you ever sit down with them and, and talk to them and oh, say, yeah. uh, I no longer do this? Oh, yeah. uh, especially um, I, in the beginning stages saying, look, I, I, I'm, my life's changed. Because mm -hmm. I know that during you're doing the drugs and things like that, that you didn't go to church and now you're oh, a devout no. Christian in, in the yeah. church. And how did that feel walking into the sanctuary. The breath of fresh air. Yeah. Um, once you get that feeling, there's no other high that can top the feeling of being completely free from any chains in this world and knowing that Jesus set you free from it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's very overwhelming. It's very powerful, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Well, I, I know that, especially when you, and people say, you know, you're free from addiction, you're free from uh, the the devil getting on to you and, and just holding you there, saying, look, you can have one more, you mm -hmm. can have one more. It's okay, it's not going to hurt the baby, it's not going to do this. Mm -hmm. And you battle on that, plus the addiction is, is very, very difficult. Oh, yeah. But I can imagine, because uh, uh, you, you wouldn't go into church between the relationships and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you had to get out of abuse like that. So you was kind of away from all that, too. Mm -hmm. And to go back as a free, free person yep. that you know that God did that for you. Mm -hmm. That's why when, when, you know, people ask you, you done it on your own? No, I did not. I had the best counselor I could have ever had, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but, uh, when and I, and, and you, you had a lot, and I know with your mom and dad mm -hmm. in the church, they were praying for oh, you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of prayers. My mama, I'm sure she probably burned some holes in the floor <laughs> with her knees. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and that goes to tell you, too, that, that sometimes prayer is not instant. No, it's not. And, and, and God went through with you, yet he had to let you go through these right. things. Uh, because if it, Probably if he took you a little earlier like that, you'd probably say, well, I can just go back home later on yeah. and stuff like that, you know. But I think he let you go through some yeah, things. I do, too. I, I've told my family this. I've, I've, I've told my fiancé this. I, I know that he allowed me to go through stuff because some part of my story might help somebody else. Right. And it might lead them. A saying that me and my fiancé both have is just plant seeds. Right. And, and and that's part of planting seed. Life is to mm -hmm. me. Life life is planting seeds for others to see where it's going to grow weeds, yeah. where it's going to grow beautiful flowers. That's right. And uh, and not saying that no, not all people can can just get through uh, without counseling. No, uh, C four Ministry is a great oh, ministry yeah. to go to there. Yeah. Uh, Bill Randall been on my show here, mm -hmm. and he told his story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know, it's it's. The people that God uses this way oh, yeah. to, to, to get other people. But counseling, sometimes we need it. Yeah, and, most and definitely. We, we see a lot of people that do need that because they don't have that that willpower. Yeah. Maybe never had God in their life. No, and once uh, once some people are so far gone, um, my son's 
biological father, he uh, he was a heroin addict. After oh. this, this escalated for him. After um, he hasn't been in my son's life since he was a year old, and that's his choice. And which, in a way, for me, the way I look at it is that he and I tell my son this. I've told him this for a long time. He knew he wasn't going to change for him. And so that was the best decision that he could have ever made for him was to not be in his life. Right. Um, because you're not thinking. No. Not rationally at all. and not at all. the safety there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it's sad. And everyone can be helped. Yep. I, I don't think there's not a person out here that, that cannot be helped. But it's if you want it. You, you've got to want because I've seen him go into rehab and stay there a week or two weeks, come out back on the same mm -hmm. thing. You've got to you got to change yourself. You got to change the environment. Mm -hmm. You got to change friends, right? Yep. And yep. I imagine you probably don't see some of the same that you've seen then. No, yeah, I mean, I don't. I might see them every now and again, like at Walmart or something. But it, and I don't look at them any different because right. you've been there. I've been there and. And like I said before, at the beginning, it's all a choice, and it's it's your choice. I don't hold nothing against anybody because it was it was me. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to blame somebody, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. And, and well, it's it's easy to do it. But, it you it's know. easy. <laughs> but I, and I've seen people that 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 do this. And when I was brought up this way, I was brought mm -hmm. up brought, uh, family abuse, uh, and, and I can see things happen like that. I can see where they turn to the bottle or turn to drugs mm -hmm. because it, it kills the pain. Yeah, uh, but that's what the devil wants you to, to think. It, it, exactly, you know. and and they have no control of that. Mm -hmm. and, and it is an addiction, and people don't realize that it's it's a sickness. It's like alcoholism. Yeah. And, uh, and when you get to into that addiction, it, it's like People that smoke, for instance, they not, may not do a bit of drugs, but they smoke, uh, and they get addicted to cigarettes. And um, they say, "Oh, I gotta have one. I gotta have one. one if I don't get them. one, I'm gonna get shaky. I'm gonna get yeah. nervous. I gotta have one for this right here." And see, that's that's a bad part of my um, addictive personality. That's that's what I'm. I smoke, mm -hmm. and um, so like it's. It's something I battle with a lot because it's like every other day I'm like, I've got to quit. I don't need these cigarettes, you know, I just chew gum, blah, blah. But as soon as something just nerve wracking happens, it's like, I got to have one. So it's it's no different than I need I need a piece of chocolate, my sweet tooth, you know. Oh, I know that one. See, I take pictures of all these things that Edna makes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I go to the doctor, and he says, my sugar's up. And you show I, I bring out the videos, yeah. yeah. She goes to the same doctor, <laughs> so he tells her, I threw her underneath the bus. <laughs> well, Katie, it's getting that top of the hour, and I really appreciate you coming and, and telling your story because it's, it's not easy. People think it's easy to do, mm. but, but it's hard to sit there and tell people uh, the, the sin and, and ugly in your all life. The ugly. But in this situation here, it's going to be a help and blessing to yeah. someone else. I hope and pray. And we, so. through the show, we, we don't know who it might be. It, it could be someone, God don't want us to know who it yep. is. And uh, just by something that you said here. So you keep up a great work. You got a fine young boy there and a Texas a Texan <laughs> from New York. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Up north is fiance and urban cowboy, right? It, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm kind of teasing her. He's sitting over at the corner. He don't want to be on, on camera or nothing. <laughs> but uh, well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank and, you for having uh, me right here. You're welcome. And it's here and here. All right. Uh, you've been listening to uh, Katie Adams' story. And I hope that you get some information from that. Next Monday. All right, I want you to get your kids up and watch next Monday. Santa Claus is coming on my show. So kids, you can call and ask him any kind of questions. i got a bunch of questions to ask him. So he's going to find out if I'm on the naughty list or not. So i got to watch my questions. So that's next Monday at 7 p.m. Santa Claus is coming to town. I'm Jerry McKee, and thank you for watching Primetime with Jerry McKee. And you have a good night.